Oh, hi, everybody. Hi, the internet. Um, well, a reminder that the first step of meditation is to silence your cell phone. Um, and the last step, of course, is to remember when we leave to turn your phone back on. Uh, we're going to do a 40-minute guided sit. Is that unusually long for anybody? Awesome. <clears throat> okay. So we'll find our meditation posture. And as I always say, for these uh, non-Herculean sits, the two things that matter are that you're comfortable enough that you won't need to move and not so comfortable that you'll fall asleep. And I'll set our timer here. And as many of you know, I'm, I'm uh, near the beginning of a multi-month series of guided meditations, trying to give a breadth of what sort of practice exists. And uh, today we're going to do Brahma Vihara practice. Brahma Vihara practice usually is metta instructions, followed by a, a brief nod to the other ones. Uh, but tonight we will be doing exclusively the other ones. So we'll spend the first maybe two minutes focusing on the breath, directing the attention inwards. We'll begin the Brahma Viharas with Mudita. There's not a clear English word that translates as Mudita. The closest word is, is that Mudita is the opposite of jealousy. Jealousy is that feeling that other people's success diminishes or blocks your own. Mudita is the idea of sharing in another person's success as though it were yours. So bring to mind an image of someone you know who's doing well. They don't have to be doing well at, at everything, but where at least something's going really well. They look super in love, or they uh, have an awesome job, or uh, they're really happy parents, and so on. Bring to mind somebody who's doing well. And we'll bring an image of this person into our mind's eye. And what we're going to do with this image is, is repeat phrases towards it. If you're more accustomed to the meta phrases, one of the hallmarks of those phrases is that they are generic, wishing something everybody would want. Here we're actually going to use phrases that are more specific. So um, since we have newlyweds in the room, we can use that as an example. So if you're thinking of a friend who just got married, think like, may you always be this happy. May your love continue and may it grow. 
And I think for most people, while, you know, we may experience jealousy in certain areas, for most of us, I think mudita is not such a hard emotion to tap into. It's a pretty normal thing to experience sometimes, that joy at someone else's success. This is all we'll do for the next few minutes. We'll picture our happy person and we'll wish for the continuance of their good fortune. And since we're in a neighborhood that's usually pretty loud outside, if some external person, or it might be a dog, some external being, grabs your attention, uh, we'll give them a phrase or two. Somebody walk, well, you know, drives by blasting music as they often do. Uh, you know, maybe you keep enjoying that music. They always have that kind of passion. Then we'll we'll come back to our person. As in any other meditation, if you get distracted, just come back. Doesn't matter how many times. And so, distracted, of course, is thinking about other things. Distracted can also be when the mantra goes flat in your head. The idea of the Brahma Vihara practice is to try to mean it every time. We're trying to cultivate as this feeling of mudita, uh, empathic joy or sympathetic joy, common translation. And so if your head turns into like, may all your success continue, may all your success, we'll call that distracted too. Bringing the person's image to mind can help refresh the intention. And if you, if you find yourself lucky enough, 
that you get that feeling. It usually shows up right in the center of your chest. You get that joyful, like ebullient feeling. And it seems stable. And it's okay to just enjoy the feeling without continuing with the phrases. The point of the phrases is really just to get the feeling stable, which often in a short sit like this, it, it, it won't. Uh, the Brahma Viharas are about uh, cultivation. Most Buddhist practices are about uh, observing states that are already there. These are about trying to create particular states. And it should feel really nice if anything about the state you're cultivating feels like too much, like it's wearing you out. Uh, back off on effort. More specifically, try relaxing first. And when you feel nice and relaxed, meaning particularly relaxing your body, for meditation effort, especially relaxing your head, and there should be this really easy cultivation of the feeling where you could do this all day.
It'll sometimes hopefully happen that you get the feeling. Other times it'll probably happen that you get nothing, to get bored and distracted. And it, it may happen that you get the opposite. That, uh, you know, you start wondering why you're not married or why your marriage isn't quite so awesome and, and those sorts of things. If that happens a little bit, just let it go. It can sometimes be purifying and just notice those things. If it's happening a lot, I would just pick somebody else. Pick somebody who's succeeding in some other way. The idea is to start easy. Start with something that's just going to help you get the feeling. The eventual idea is to stretch it such that, uh, you know, when the politicians you hate have some successes, some little part of your heart's like, I'm glad you have success in your life. That's not a normal emotion. That's a big stretch of the normal emotion. The idea here is to start easy. And may whoever's, I think, hammering on the ceiling continue in the success of their construction project. So uh, we'll, we'll let go of this happy person. Uh, we'll wave goodbye. And uh, we'll focus next on compassion. So uh, bring to mind somebody who's not doing well. Same thing. Uh, uh, maybe their marriage is pretty happy, but they are struggling with finances. It doesn't have to be somebody whose life is a complete disaster in every respect. But uh, we want to bring to mind somebody who's, who's struggling, who's having a hard time. Mudita, I think, is, as I said, a pretty straightforward emotion. Most of us feel it. Compassion is a less straightforward emotion. Uh, not everybody feels it or, or feels it easily. Uh, Sharon Salzberg says compassion is a movement of the heart in response to someone's suffering. What I would say is the hallmark of compassion is it should feel good and it shouldn't feel like when you watch the news about war or climate change and you get this kind of overwhelming, gosh, there's a lot of terrible things and I can't do anything about it. That kind of feeling that pulls you down, compassion should have none of that. I've met a few people in my life who seem almost like compassion junkies. It feels so good for them to be around suffering people that they seek them out. So one way to do that is, is uh, particularly if you're new to this, don't start with people in war zones. Uh, start somewhere easier. Another thing that can help is uh, what should feel good is actually just the wish. Uh, any kind of like devising a plan for how someone's suffering is going to decrease or uh, how you're going to intervene to try to help. I mean, certainly do intervene to try to help if you can, but it's not exactly what we're going for here. Uh, of course, there will be times where the people we care about are suffering and there's not a thing we can do. Uh, but there is actually this like beautiful feeling that can be hard to find, but we'll, we'll practice cultivating it here. So it's the same as the mudita. We'll, we'll take the person who's suffering in some area and we'll just wish for the relief of that suffering. Somebody's struggling with money. Uh, may you find work. May you have enough. May you have what you need. And I find when I get the feeling, it has this like approach quality to it. I want to like move towards the person. I want to hug them. If, uh, if I do this towards somebody who's in the room, it actually takes a little bit of effort to like make sure I stay in my seat. <laughs>
And if you get distracted, try to revitalize it in the same way. If it starts feeling heavy or hopeless, or you start feeling involved, if you can't back out, but pick someone easier. The easiest image for me of compassion is uh, hearing about a 15-year-old going through a breakup. That from their perspective, this is a, a life-ruining tragedy. And from my perspective, it's not. Like, I can really care about their suffering, but in a way that doesn't hurt me, in a way that like actually injects a lot of hope in. I find that the easiest sort of entry point. And finally, we'll do the third of the other ones, which is equanimity. It has a quite different character from these other two. The other two to me feel pretty like active, alive. Equanimity can get blissful after a while. In the beginning, it's usually a feeling of peace, feeling like taking off a heavy backpack. So for equanimity, we don't need to bring anybody to mind. The idea is to repeat a mantra that helps you remember that, while of course there are some things in the universe you can and should control, um, most of it you really can't. And so it's that sense of what the theistic traditions would call surrender. In the theistic tradition, you surrender to God. God controls the universe, not you. Surrender is, I think, an easier sort of uh, access point to the same emotion. So if you do have the kind of worldview where there's something to surrender to, 
I would use a mantra along those sorts of lines. Uh, you know, your will be done, something like that. The Buddhist mantras around equanimity, uh, my favorite one I've heard is just the phrase, this is not my universe. To me, it feels really nice. Of course, you know, I'm intellectually aware that this is not my universe. But I spend a lot of time feeling like, well, it's like mostly my universe. Maybe there's a couple little things out of my hands. So uh, we don't need a visualization unless there's one that helps you. One that help can be things that remind you of the vastness of the universe. So it's okay to do it without. If you, uh, if there's some kind of deity image uh, that works for you, or like an image of a Buddha, um, you can use that. You can also use something like the night sky, uh, the structure of an atom, something reminding you of the vastness and complexity of the universe. So it makes you f accurately feel like a almost negligibly small part of a, almost or maybe truly infinite universe. So if you want one of those images, you can bring those to mind. And we'll repeat some phrase that helps us let go of control of the universe. Uh, of course the goal isn't to, you know, control nothing, cease all activism and so on. Uh, the, the goal is simply to be able to create the state of being okay with things as they are. It doesn't cause you to lose access to desire and motivation and capacity for change. But of course, there'll be lots of good things that we can't make stay and bad things we can't make go away. An awfully nice sort of feeling to cultivate. And one obstacle you'll sometimes find here is this like fear of equanimity's near enemy, equanimity's fraternal twin, like a cynical detachment. I would try not to worry too much about that. For this evening at least, it's just too short of a time to really fall into some unwholesome mind state. If you get more into this sort of practice, there are ways to counteract that. Another obstacle can be the idea of not this time, you know, whatever I'm dealing with right now, this is a thing I really do need to change. And uh, until the bell rings, you really can't change or do anything. So even if there's something you really can't leave up to uh, God or fate for the whole night, uh, you essentially have to leave it up to the machinations of the universe for the remaining few minutes of the sit.
And one more peaceful thing you can, can do is surrender how the practice is going. Are you remembering what you're doing? Are you getting lost? Are you getting equanimity? Are you not? It's not my universe. It's not my neurons. everybody